Thank you, Yula. So we saw, we saw it, permafrost is warming, and it's warming everywhere. Actually, at uh, the Alfred Wegener Institute, we are coordinating an international database, the first established database on permafrost temperatures. It's called GTNP. And that database is showing that consistently in Siberia, in North America, but also in mountains where permafrost is, permafrost is warming. So what we need to understand now is what that means for us. And mostly it means two things. It has impacts on infrastructure, ecosystems, so that's one thing, so on things that man deal with, mankind deals with directly on the ground. And then it also has some impacts on the global climate. And what I'm gonna be focusing in that presentation, impacts on infrastructure and ecosystems, and then you're gonna get a presentation from Sarah Charburn of the meaning of the permafrost warming and permafrost thawing for global climate. Impacts are quite spectacular, and you see these pictures everywhere in the media. This is actually next to Fairbanks, and this was a picture that was provided to me by Vladimir Romanovsky. You've seen many pictures of uh, houses collapsing into the ground. We'll see later why those pictures are not necessarily reflecting what we are seeing, but in any case, they are showing you that permafrost is thawing, and permafrost is thawing in very different manners. That house is tilted. That means that it is thawing on one side, probably more abruptly than the other side. That means that you might have more ice in the ground on one side than the other one. We are on a scale on a few couple of meters. Yulia showed for ponds how those ponds varied across the several, like a very micro scale. This is exactly the same with permafrost. We have locations with lots of ice, locations with less ice. And it's very hard to predict, very hard to map these kind of hazards. But there are lots of them, and you can see them, actually the upper left picture here that you see is in Yakutsk, one of the largest, if not the largest city built on permafrost. And there are impacts on railroads, on uh, roads, on uh, airports, major impacts on airports, for instance, in the Canadian Arctic. You see that also on buildings. This is a picture taken again from uh, Russia on the left side, and some in unexpected places. That hole that you see in the ground here was, I think, taken in Fairbanks, and it came just in one day. So these things happen like that because you have lots of ice in the ground and it remains very difficult to predict. So the issue is that, is that now that we are in a situation where permafrost is thawing, we need to make decisions. How do we build on permafrost when permafrost is thawing? Or more exactly, do we build for a permafrost or a non-permafrost world? In the Arctic, we've been building for years on piles. This is a picture that you see on top. It's not to make it pretty or to go fishing because there is water. It's actually to preserve the permafrost underneath, to let air, cold air, circulate in the winter underneath the houses so that permafrost stay frozen. Now, do we try to go deeper and get deeper piles if the permafrost is frozen, or do we try and hope that we're gonna let it down on top uh, for a non-permafrost environment? It's very hard because you can have ice down to 20, 30, 40 meters in the ground. And it's, again, very hard to predict. And as Eula said, we can't really map that with satellites. It's very hard to predict. <clears throat> the other impacts that we see and that are very substantial is uh, circulation of water. Eula again showed that distribution of ponds everywhere in the Arctic landscape. It's very, very prominent. But what we don't, what we haven't seen is the circulation of this water across the surface. We have big rivers, we have small catchments, we have a lot of rivers, lots of water circulating across the surface in the Arctic. <clears throat> and when a thermocast land forms, this is what we see on that thing here, that huge lens-like -like feature that is driven by the thawing and the melting of ice that is contained in the permafrost, occurs next to the rivers. It can deliver massive amounts of sediment. And with this sediment come nutrients, and come obviously organic carbon and, uh, in, the, in the river, but comes also a lot of turbidity. This picture is taken actually on the Peel Plateau in northern Canada, and you can see here the impact of the slump. You can see the water flowing very clear from the bottom here, and then on the underneath part, um, the, the amount of sediment being, um, the sediment from the slump actually entering the river flow. This has major impacts on the catchment and major impact on the fish in the catchment. This one is actually a small one. There are some that are massive. In the Siberian Arctic, there is one near Patagai that is across like more than a kilometer long. 
So you can see that it landforms that retreat like 10 to 15 meters a year contribute massive amount of sediment. The other thing that we see and that is very, very significant in the Arctic, across the Arctic, is a collapse of uh, ice cellars. The ice cellars are used by communities as a very traditional way to store food. And this is a very, this is not a gadget. This is very traditional, but this is used on a daily basis by the communities. Hunting, harvesting in the summer, storing of the caribou food, when comes the fall, and that food is then taken on frozen, stays frozen in the permafrost cellars. But as permafrost warms, most of these permafrost cellars are actually under threat. So this is something that lots of people are working on, but you need a specialist to do that. And there are not a lot of permafrost cellar engineers. It is not in any curriculum in, around the world, so you need to actually devise strategies to do that. So it's a very much an ad hoc solution, as it has been when they were built, but lots of these things are also uh, protected now as cultural heritage. And you need to actually envisage, like, envision some, some clever strategies to combine that ad hoc type of uh, funding and then get some uh, adequate and modern uh, engineering um, strategies to preserve them. The other thing that we see and the major impacts is uh, coastal erosion. Why is it important? Well, because one third, one third of the coasts of the world are permafrost coast. This is often underestimated, but when you look at the map of the Arctic, you can realize that. Lots of islands in Canada, in the Canadian Arctic archipelago, lots of, lots of islands with very wiggly type of coastlines. Those coastlines are all permafrost coastlines, and they erode at quite substantial rates, half a meter a year. That's a lot of material coming into the ocean. Some sections are eroding at 20 meters a year. I made that slide about two years ago, and now we have sections of coast eroding at 30 meters a year. 30 meters, 40 meters in northern Alaska. So it is quite a substantial. And there is already infrastructure on this coast, and there is infrastructure to be built. Think of Yamal and the huge reserves of gas that are there. Obviously, these coasts are also ice-rich and are likely to be eroded at quite substantial erosion rates. The other impact that is associated with coastal erosion, and here behind me you see a map of the erosion rates. Quite simple map, when you have this rate, is strong erosion rates, where you have in green is stable erosion rate. I can tell you that the data is already outdated. This is something that we published in 2012, but now rates have increased in many sections uh, along the Arctic. Why is it important? Because indeed you have a lot of material. And a lot of material is coming from the coast here. This is showing you the amount of organic carbon coming from this coast. Huge amount of organic carbon, almost the same as the amount provided by rivers in the particulate fraction, what we call the solid fraction, uh, coming from these rivers, this, from this coast, sorry. This is quite substantial, and in the coastal ecosystem has wide implications that we don't really understand what it means in terms of fish and in terms of changes to the food web. And we are just at the beginning of understanding these kind of processes. This is also important because if you have a lot of erosion, you have a lot of threat and hazards in the coastal zone. Many communities are affected by that. You've probably seen pictures from Shishmaref, from Kivalin, Alaska, Toktayak Tuk in, uh, in Canada. They are less publicized situations also in the Shukshishi in Russia, where we see communities literally falling into the sea. Sometimes it's bad planning, and they were located at the wrong place in the first place, but erosion is there, and erosion is contributing to erode those communities and let them fall into the sea. What you see here is a map from Alaska showing community, communities envisioning or planning or exploring relocation options. A lot of them are at the coast or along rivers. It's historically places where you could harvest, where you could subsist. But these are places that are now under threat. So what does that mean in terms of dollars? And this is a figure that is very hard to pinpoint in permafrost research because virtually no one is looking at that. Permafrost is also new research, if you think at it, in terms of its wide implications from the Earth's climate system and for the economic system, because until now it was very much approached as an engineering kind of topic. It's only fairly new, 10, 20, 25 years that we entered like, and we understood the meaning of permafrost for the global system. Here these numbers are showing you the impact of permafrost, economic impact of permafrost, though only in terms of infrastructure. 
if permafrost is thawing, how much GDP are we gonna losing due to permafrost thaw? This is the estimation for 2010. This is a fairly crude estimation, which is an extrapolation of values gained in Alaska to the entire circumarctic, but that's the best we have for now. And this is the estimation for 2030. And you can see that it's multiplied by five. So granted, those numbers are fairly crude, and there'd be some value from doing that, but bet there is no better numbers. So that's what we need to work on on the communities, understand and articulate that relationship, both at the local level in communities, but also put that in a broader context, because those numbers are very substantial. Now I've talked very much about the impact on infrastructure, and I told you that Sarah is gonna talk about the impacts on the global climate. But before she does that, I would just wanna give you a little uh, glimpse of what that means in, again, in terms of dollar value. We were talking here of the early cost of $150 billion in 2030 only for infrastructure. Now in terms of the cost for the global climate and the impact of the rest of the world, permafrost also has a substantial cost. This is a paper that was published very recently by Kevin Schaeffer and a colleague, and they took an economic model and took the models output that Sarah is gonna talk about and combined them to actually show how much it would cost to the world. What you see on that graph is simply on the bottom a time scale and then a value in uh, billions, uh, in trillions here. And then the dashed line are basically the 5% lower estimate, the 95% top estimate. So it gives you a range and shows you that the range is enormous. So we don't have the good models to work out that economic impact. That's the first lesson and we need to work on that. But the second lesson is that those impacts are quite substantial. 43 trillion uh, dollars a year. This is quite substantial and I think that's what I want to leave you at because I want to show you now how Sarah is actually working out options to better constrain that number. This is the main challenge that we have uh, for the next 10 years. Thank you. <laughs>